the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. I've already had a chance to greet some of you at the between service hour, and it's a delight to be there. And also for those who've joined us to this service, I'm just thrilled to be back at St. George's. This congregation has a, a very special place in, in my heart. Um, but also I take I never take preaching the gospel for granted. It's a great privilege to be invited to do so, and I'm very grateful to Don and Jesse for their <coughs> friendship over the years uh, and their wonderful hospitality. It's always a, a delight to be here, and we've got many wonderful memories of our trips. We've been coming for quite a few years. But there was one trip that we made that was not so wonderful. Uh, we flew into Denver, and uh, in the usual jostling at the baggage belt, uh, my bag with all of my clothes and all my Episcopal hardware was stolen. Now, I was just a new bishop, and so I didn't realize you should never put your hardware in, one, in a check bag. But also, I got all my new stuff. I got my, my cross, my, my ring, all the stuff that, you know, the important stuff, at least I thought. Uh, but my crozier was a gift from special friends. It was very expensive, and, uh, and I couldn't see how I was ever going to replace it. But not long after, we made a trip to the United Kingdom and we went to stay with friends in the Cotswolds. So some of you know the Cotswolds is a, a delightful part of England. It still looks like how like England should look, you know, with green rolling hills and beautiful homes and sheep on the hillsides and, and shepherds wandering around. And in a moment of inspiration, I said to my host, do you have a shepherd's supply store? I mean, shepherds have got to buy their gear from somewhere. Uh, and they said, yes, we do. So I went over, we walked into this place. It was amazing. All of the paraphernalia for country living was there. You know, every proper thing you needed. And I said, do you have any shepherd staff? They said, oh, yes. And they had a whole selection. Now, I don't want to tell you how many different kinds of shepherd staff there are, but there are lots. But they said, this is one of our cheap versions. Um, <laughs> and it's, it com comes apart, and so you can travel with it. And we found it really attractive to bishops on a budget. <laughs> Well, that described me well, uh, and so I said, well, I'll take it, and it's here, and, and I take it with me, because indeed the bishop's staff is not meant to be some kind of ornate thing, it's meant to remind us that our fundamental calling is to be a shepherd. Now, in case you was asking the question, I am not the good shepherd, okay, just in case there's any doubt about that, I'm very much a junior assistant, uh, but my question for you is, do you actually know the good shepherd? The shepherd. Not do you know about him. You've all seen pictures of the good shepherd. You've all most likely seen pictures in Sunday school of the good shepherd. We, even though we don't have any sheep wandering in Colorado, though there are some, uh, it's, you know, we actually have got an idea about the good shepherd. But my question is, do you actually know him? Now, if you're not sure, and if you really can't answer yes, then what I have to share with you this morning will change your life. But if you do know the Good Shepherd, then I want to tell you that more about how to relate to him, how to know him, that will make your life more abundant and, I believe, more satisfying. So, question, how do we get to know the Good Shepherd? How do we get to know him? Well, the first is to recognize his walk. Now, Angela and I have got, been blessed with five children and 12 perfect grandchildren. <laughs> and some of you doubt that, but we have photographs, we have videos, we can prove it. <laughs> um, but what we're discovering and Don, this is going to come to you. You're going to be discovering that our grandchildren have got unmistakable family traits. Some are good, others not so. Uh, one thing I noticed, for example, in our daughters, uh, quite a few of them have a, a laugh that's kind of like Angela's. Uh, my son, John, is starting to walk like me. And now he's losing his hair, so he's starting to look like me. Now, I'm not sure that's a good thing, but... It truly is a God thing that Jesus walks like his father. He's not simply some standalone character who appears out of nowhere. See, Jesus walks through sacred history. He walks like his father. He was sent by his father. He fulfills the ancient prophecies. He was born of a virgin, as the prophet Isaiah had anticipated. He made his appearance in Bethlehem, as Mike had predicted. He came in the fullness of time, and he walked in real history. Jesus walked on this planet. He's no simply fairy story. He walked on this planet and changed the world for good. You know, one of my favorite Bible stories 
is that of the prodigal son. Actually, the title is wrong because it really tells us a lot more about the father than the son. You may remember, it's the father who stands waiting for his son to return. It is the father who breaks all tradition and runs when his son comes near. It is the father who reaches out to embrace the one who has spurned his love. It is the father who calls for a celebration for his son who was once dead but is now alive. And Jesus walks like his father. See, Jesus doesn't wait for you to get your life in order before he welcomes you home. Aren't you pleased about that? Jesus doesn't insist that you jump lots of hurdles and pass all kinds of tests before he's willing to hold you in his arms. Jesus is simply waiting for you to open the door of your life and say yes to him so that he can enter. He could break the door down. He could just simply insist. But he doesn't because he is the good shepherd who walks like his father. And it's not just his walk, but it's also his words. Listen to his words. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name. He leads them out. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Now surely every one of us has experienced that moment of being weary and burdened and simply can't put one foot in front of another. Have you all, you've all been there. We've all felt like life is too much. Just crashing down, pull the bed covers over your head. Let's shut the world out. Let's not go anywhere. We've all felt that way. But Jesus speaks to us and says, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You see, the gospel is good news for lots, lots of reasons, but one of them is because he wants to, to embrace you, to bring you healing from the curses all around you. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I mean, have you heard those words? I don't mean just let them go by, but have you internalized those words? Because these are the words of the good shepherd. And there's something amazing to me about those words. Do you know they were first spoken 2,000 years ago in a faraway place in a language few of us could understand, and yet they still speak to us today. How can it be that such ancient words are still relevant? Because they are God's words. But you have to listen. You know, C.S. Lewis one of my great heroes once put it this way, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but shouts to us in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Now, friends, today there are many voices competing for our attention. There's voices all over the place, in the media, politicians, media experts, all kinds of folks yelling at us, telling us things, promising us the good life, promising the quick fix, send an end to all your troubles. I get in my inbox... Every day I get dozens of people telling me, promising me all kind of stuff. The problem is, they don't deliver. They can't deliver. The only words that have been proven true throughout all time are the words of the Good Shepherd. His words are true. You can count on them. His words are timeless. You can rely upon them. His words are dependable. You can trust them. His words are healing. You can embrace on them. His words are powerful. You can live by them. They can even waken the dead. Remember the time when Jesus was confronted by the news that his friend Lazarus was dead. Mary and Martha were grief-stricken and Jesus wept. But when he arrived at the grave, he told them to take away the stone and he shouted, Lazarus, come out! And he came out. You see, the words of the good shepherd are true. They work. But we have to listen to them. You know, I've known people who were dead to the things of God come alive. I've seen broken marriages made whole. I've, I've known blind people have their sight restored. I've seen people who were in utter bondage to addiction being set free. See, his words have power. We have to listen to his voice. They are words to be obeyed. They are the words that will only truly give us hope, hope that will last. I had a friend who said to me one day, he said, you know what, I believe in Jesus. I simply don't believe a word he said. There are folks like that. Yeah, Jesus is fine. As long as he doesn't get into my life or in my way. But we don't have that option. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. My grandson's a Marine. And uh, he's just graduated from DLI, the Defense Language Institute out in Monterey. And uh, one of the things he learned in, in boot camp is that when a drill instructor gives you a command, it's not an invitation to a conversation. <laughs> it is, in fact, a command. Now, some of his classmates didn't know that. Uh, one of his 
friends thought when the drill instructor declared something, it was an opportunity to engage in conversation. Didn't work so well. And so he finished up swearing at the drill instructor, getting frustrated. Well, you know, that didn't go very well either. So we went back and started boot camp again. They did it twice. And then he was asked to, to move on. Now, we understand that in the military, but do we understand that when it comes to the things of God? Now, you say, hold it. That's kind of harsh, kind of mean. No, no, no. This call to obedience is not from a God who wants to make our lives miserable. He's not commanding us to do things that will hurt us or harm us. He's actually got the very best for us. Listen to his words. Obey his words and you discover that the good shepherd wants the very best for you. It may not always be a life of ease or a life, but it will be a life of meaning. Sometimes you will pass through the valley of the shadow of death, but there is no need to fear because the good shepherd is right there walking alongside you. And he has promised that goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And there's something else. Look at his way. Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go out and find pasture. You know, sheep pens in Jesus' time were kind of, the shepherds moved around a lot, they're kind of nomadic, so they would have to build sheep pens wherever they got to, and they would use whatever they could find and build kind of a, a, kind of a circular pen. And then at the opening, they didn't have time to, or wood to build gates, and they would simply lay themselves across the entrance. So that literally the sheep had to climb over them or go under them or through them to get in and out. You got the picture? It's a powerful picture. That's the picture that Jesus is painting. The shepherd himself becomes the door of the sheep. No one could enter the pen and no one could leave it without going through the shepherd himself. And what a beautiful picture of how we enter into the closer presence of God. Jesus later said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is his way. It is through him. It is by grace. It is not something that we can earn or for which we must strive. It is God's gift. Thank goodness the gospel is not only for those who can you know, get theological degrees or get advanced degrees or be very wealthy or have big houses. The gospel is for every person who's willing to listen. And God has a special inclination towards those who are broken. He invites them into his presence. It is God's gift. The Apostle Paul puts it this way. For it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith. It's not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That's his way. There's something else about the way that he works. It's very personal. The sheep hear his voice. He calls them by name. Have you ever got stuck in the Bible when you read those genealogies? It's the lay reader's, the lector's nightmare to be given that lesson with all those names listed and you know someone's sitting there, he's got that wrong. <laughs> or in the Old Testament, you see all, all those lists of kings, all those kind of folks? You know what would be different if your name was there? You read them very differently then. Have you found when you're getting a directory from some organization you belong to, the first thing you do is look at your name, make sure it's right? See, the whole point is that those names, those lists of names are there for lots of reasons, but one of them is to establish, first of all, the truth and historicity of what we believe. There's a record there. It's just real history. It's not something kind of made up out of nothing. But also, those people count. Every person counts. And that's the point. Every person has a name. Every person is unique and important to God. And that's why I hate it when we refer dismissively to people in these nameless categories. When we, we say, oh, it's, the, it's a problem of the homeless. Or it's the homosexuals, the homophobes. When we have these categories where we dehumanize people, put them in blocks, and we just kind of dismiss them. See, that's so against the way the Good Shepherd thinks. He knows everyone's name. People have names. But it's so easy to slide into that. I know I do it. When we moved into New York a few years back, we were living on the Upper West Side of Manhattan and there were a lot of homeless folks. I gotta admit, when I first confronted this, I was nervous. It looked scary. When we drove into Manhattan, we drove from Louisiana. I can't imagine how hick time we were. We just drove up with our station wagon and we said, wow, we're in New York. And we got out, looked around, and the first thing we did was lock the car door. <laughs> Have you done that? You just walk in just in case those homeless might approach us. But then after a while, I, within a few weeks, I discovered, you know those people? They've all got names. They've all got stories. 
And if we took the time to actually find out what their names and stories were, we'd discover they weren't that different from us. Their life took some bad turns. We know, no one sets to their career goal to become homeless. It's not, a, it's not an easy life. And I discovered you can actually start talking to folks and listening to who they are. You discover it's a person for whom Christ died. People have names, they have stories, and the Good Shepherd knows them. And sh so should we, but it's so easy to forget. One time I was visiting a hospital and I heard the, the x-ray nurse announce, well, we've had two backs, one arm, two legs so far this morning. We've got three more backs coming later. And I looked at her because I was there. I think Andrew was having her back x-rayed and I was there with her. And I looked at the nurse and said, you mean three people? Oh, yeah, yeah. But she knew what I was saying. It's easy to simply <laughs> refer to people as objects or as things, or as just part of a crowd. That's not the way of the Good Shepherd. He knows us by name. He knows everything about us. He knows when we do well. He also knows when we fail. We don't like people to know when we fail. We don't tell our family sometimes, or our friends, but God knows. Some when, when you're young, you're afraid to come home and Admit your grade wasn't that good. You're afraid what parents might say. But God has never, ever turned away from you. One time I was, I was not good at this. I had my daughter Sarah, who's now a doctor and qualified, but she called home from college. It was her first term. She said, Dad, I got four A's and a B. And you know what I did, don't you? What's with the B? Didn't you study? What's that all about? She was crushed. So she, she did what my family do. She called her sister Helen, who called her sister Catherine, who called Andrew, who beat me up. That, that's the way our family works. You know, they just, the word came around. What was I thinking? But you know, with the Lord, he never says, what about the bee? He just says, I love you. I love you for who you are. He knows when we fail for the hundredth time, but he loves us still. He knows you. He cares about you. He's never too busy to listen to you. Others may shut you out or walk by on the other side, but not the good shepherd. That is simply not his way. There's something else. The good shepherd is willing to leave the 99 sheep that are safe and look for the one who is lost. See, he cares about the least, the last, and the lost. And if we want to follow his example, we must do the same. So, we need to recognize his walk, listen to his words, look at his way, and also remember his work. The work of the Good Shepherd is to lay down his life for his sheep, and he did, ju did, that, did just that, once and for all, once and for all time. And because we, he did, we can all approach his throne with confidence, knowing that the sacrifice has been made, that all of our sins have been forgiven, our lives made new. That is the Good Shepherd's work, and it's a remarkable gift that is available to all. Years ago, Angela and I had the privilege of planting a church in Lafayette, Louisiana. It was a great privilege. Uh, we called ourselves the church without walls. We never had any buildings. Uh, we met in a Catholic high school. Uh, where the local Catholic uh, community welcomed us and gave us a space to use. And we welcomed people from all kinds of places. And half our congregation were in recovery. We, we somehow managed, God blessed us to be able to welcome folks who were struggling with alcoholism, with all kinds of issues, and let them know they were loved, they were valued, and welcomed among us. And it was a great privilege to be in that church. And I still think that we still stay in touch with many of the people and remember the stories of the lives that were touched and transformed. Uh, I could tell you and spend the next, rest of the day telling you stories about the lives we touched. I'll just tell you one little story. A guy called Chris. Chris was a teacher, a brilliant man, uh, lots of earned degrees, doctorates and things. Uh, he was teaching at the local Episcopal school. He was greatly loved by his students, but he told me, you know, it's not always been this way. He said, I used to be very angry and very arrogant. I knew how good I was, and I made sure everybody else knew. It didn't play very well at home. I finished up destroying one marriage and was on his way to destroying his second marriage. One day he went into the chapel of the school where he was teaching, this is before he came to us, 
There's an old-fashioned chapel in front of it that had a big cross, and on hanging on the cross was a representation of the body of Christ, an old-fashioned crucifix. He's seen it hundreds of times, but this time, as he's sitting in the back of the church chapel looking at it, he saw it as if it was for the very first time. He looked at that cross and realized that Christ had died for him, that it was his arrogance, his anger, his resentment, his ego that had nailed Christ to the cross. He sat there and began to weep. He realized that Christ had died for him, that his sins would have driven those nails into his flesh. He began to sob, then to weep. He wept so loud that he, he fell into losing his voice. But when he left that chapel that day, he knew he was a new man. Everybody else knew something had happened. And he never looked back. See, Christ's work on the cross has set him free. And that is the work of the Good Shepherd. It is a finished work that he has done for you and me. It is the way into the abundant life because we no longer have to, have to live with the, the burden of sin robbing us of our joy. And when it, there are times, I'm sure all of us, pick up the baggage of our past life and try to carry it with us. And it can burden us. But when that happens, all we need to do is take that baggage and lay it at the foot of the cross because it is a finished work. The good shepherd says, it is done. It is a good gift from the good shepherd. Now, I pray that by now you know him a little better. I know that you can recognize his walk because it is the walk of the Father. Listen to his words. They are the words of life. We will only believe and obey. We can look at his way. It's the way into the Father's love and has your name upon it. And remember his work. It is the finished work of the cross. It is the gift that truly keeps on giving. But there's one more thing. I want you to listen again to that last verse of the text. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will heed my voice. So there shall be one flock and one shepherd. And who are those other sheep? You know, folks have kind of wondered about that. Who was who he referring to? But you see, from the very beginning of his earthly ministry, Jesus made it clear that the ethnic, religious, and economic divides of the world at that time would not bind him. His passion was to reach everyone, rich and poor, male, female, slave and free, Jew and Gentile. But for 2,000 years later, those divisions are still bedeviling us. That part of his work has yet to be completed, and that's where you come in. Let me conclude by telling you a little story. I, I, in my preparation for this sermon, I was introduced to the, the life and ministry of a man called Peter Cameron Scott. Now, Peter Scott was born in 1867 in Scotland, and as many of that kind of generation went out to Africa to, to share the good news of the gospel. But also, sadly, like many of this generation, he got malaria and had to go back home. Otherwise, he would have died. Well, he was reluctant to give in, so he tried again. This time he was especially joyful because his brother John joined him. But the joy evaporated as John fell victim to the fever and Scott finished up burying his own brother by himself. And the grave, at the grave, rededicated himself to preaching the gospel. He tried again, but again his health broke and he had to return to Britain utterly discouraged. Twice he'd gone out to serve the Lord. Twice he'd been beaten down. Perhaps some of you have felt that. You've done your very best and uh, still isn't working. But then something remarkable happened to him. He went to London to Westminster Abbey and stood at the tomb of David Livingstone. And looking at the tomb, he read the words of that text, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. It was, it was emblazoned on the side of, of David Livingstone's tomb. And as he reflected upon those words and the life and witness of that remarkable man, God used those words to give him the confidence to return to Africa a third time and to stay there for the rest of his life. And the fruit of his life and ministry still exists today. He founded something called the African Inland Mission. It has now grown to become one of Africa's largest mission agencies, worked in more than 20 countries, has reached literally millions of people, millions of people whose lives have been transformed, who now know the Good Shepherd and the, and the service of the Good Shepherd. In fact, some of those people are the ones that have blessed us and frankly returned the favor to give us the, the blessing of their friendship and of their support and their inspiration. See, Peter Cameron Scott knew that it was not enough to simply know the Good Shepherd, 
but we must also be willing, prepared to follow him wherever he leads. My next question is to you again. Where is the good shepherd leading you? He's not just standing still walking in a circle. Sheep are going somewhere. He's leading. See, there are so many people close by and around the world that do not yet know the good shepherd who laid down his life for them. I was talking to a friend just yesterday who told me that in this fair city of Colorado Springs, known often for the Christian presence of all the various mission agencies and stuff, that there's only 15% of this population actually in regular worship in any kind of church fellowship. 15%. That's pretty poor. 85% of the folks in this town don't know the Good Shepherd, or at least don't know him enough to care. 85%. Who are those folks? Well, you know what? They're in school with you. They're living in your neighborhood, maybe even in your families, all around you. And I believe the Good Shepherd is calling you to reach out to them, to share something of the love that you've received, the hope and the encouragement. To do so the way the Good Shepherd did. You know, remember his walk. He didn't go beating them ahead with, over the head with the staff. He reached out and, and drew them in. He gave them words of life. Not just you know, polite chit chat. He gave them the word that they could depend upon. He showed them his father's love. Friends, I believe God is calling you to do just that. Don't only know the Good Shepherd to follow where he leads. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you and I bless you. The deed you've you sent the good shepherd to care for me, for each one of us. Give us the courage to follow where he leads and to reach out to the world around us with the good news of his love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.